Back in the mid 1860s, Hanover was on the verge of industrialization, but we were still about 85 to 90 percent agricultural. Uh, and that was a big, big plus. One of the things that put Hanover on the map, especially for the battle, was we had a railroad stop and tracks and we had a telegraph office and a few of our streets were starting to be paved. So you had those three modernized elements going on, plus having three or four major roads feeding into Hanover uh, put us on the map is for transportation. For example, we lost our entire southern market of wagon manufacturing. That was our other big business we had. Uh, the Germans, when they settled in Hanover, hence our name, uh, were primarily clockmakers and almost the technicians of their day. But uh, we were uh, a largely agricultural, but we got a lot of rumors. Hanover's in the middle of rumors. The rebels are coming, the rebels are coming. Well, they never showed up, they never showed up. So it was one of these of crying wolf when Jeb Stewart's cavalry division finally did show up from Rockville, Maryland. No, 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 you've been telling us that since 1861. And all of a sudden, right down the middle of Han uh, Hanover, our main street there, come Jeb Stewart's Cav Confederate cavalry. So for almost a day, Hanover was occupied by a foreign nation's army, the Confederate States of America. So we have that. But that's the shortcut that Jeb Stewart was looking to uh, drag the 125 supply wagons that he had captured in Rockville, Maryland, to get it to Lee's um, amassing forces around Gettysburg. Hanover is supposed to be a shortcut for that, but when he met with another fellow who has a very historical name, George Armstrong Custer, he was forced, uh, Jeb was forced out of it, and he had to go almost all the way around to Chambersburg and then down to, to Gettysburg. So that delay put him in Gettysburg on day two, late on day two of the three-day battle, and just think if he would got on those supplies that were in that wagon, um, the outcome at Gettysburg could have been questionable. So we like to think Hanover saved the nation. <laughs> well, it was a strictly a cavalry engagement, so there was lots of movement. No soldiers marching, no positions had to be dug, that kind of thing. So they said, uh, some people said the whole uh, actual battle took about an hour and a half, you know, as ac actual fighting. Uh, so with, there was a lot of movement. It was very flexible to keep going with, with the, and the big problem was like Gettysburg was the July heat. You've got dead horses and 40 something casualties strewn along the streets of, of Hanover. And uh, the first time that one of, uh, I think Stewart himself acknowledged for the first time as we drove, rode further north, Hanover was the only time that the civilians took up arms in addition to the federal army and were firing at us from up stores and second story windows as we rode through Hanover. That was really unusual for them. Most of the time, everybody headed to their basements, like in Gettysburg. Of course, Gettysburg was a much more you know, three-day event with heavy artillery. We had artillery, and that's one of the examples we have here. I don't know if you want to maybe pick that up with the story. Okay, what we have here is a Confederate reed shell. It's a British design. It was fired from Mount Olivet Cemetery uh, into Hanover in an attempt to keep uh, Custer's uh, Northern Cavalry out of town. Uh, as you notice, it didn't explode when it hit. It, it went through the upstairs bedroom of the Weinbrenner house on Frederick Street, in through the second floor, into their daughter's bedroom. She was in her bed then. The shell rolled into the hallway, still smoking. Dad came upstairs and picked it up and threw it into the garden, and it still doesn't explode. So we fortunately, this came down all through history in its really good condition. And it's one of our premier Civil War exhibits, at the three and a half inch reed Confederate shell. The phrase here, I like what his wife said, we call it the understatement of the Battle of Hanover. I think we better go downstairs or we might be in danger here. So we had to have that up as it's sort of like a um, marquee element there in, in the exhibit. But when the shell came into her bedroom, we have this 1963 picture of during the centennial of the battle. It broke open the front drawer, three drawers down, exited the back, you can see the fractured casing of the... And so this shell has a lot of opportunity to explode, and it never did. And we, and we found out from Scott Mangus, one of our Civil War authorities here in Hanover, that the dud rate of Confederate artillery or munitions was fairly high compared to Northern, northern versions. Ah, let me mention earlier that Hanover had a telegrapher. Uh, telegraphers were the digital guys of the 19th century. 
They knew how to send the new telegraph medium of the Morse code, the dots and dashes over the wire. But there were also wanted men by both sides and the Confederates, as they worked their way out of the Shenandoah Valley into Maryland and finally into the first battle on Northern soil, which was the Battle of Hanover, they were looking for the telegraphers to have them read the messages going back and forth on the wires to intercept intelligence. Well, Daniel Trone, which is our local telegraph and in our telegraph office here, said, realize he was a marked man. So when, when Custer's, not Custer, excuse me, when Jeb Stewart's cavalry started moving into town here as a, in a big charge, he pulled the wires out of his telegraph key, I'm paraphrasing, threw the key up into a barn loft and headed to Philadelphia. After the battle was over, he returned back to, here, to Hanover, reconnected his wires and started sending the messages the, the rebels were here, they have left, they're heading west. And then started connecting, connecting and sending messages not only to Baltimore, but to Philadelphia. And they would then forward those messages on to Washington and maybe New York would have had a stronger message uh, telegraph set. One of the interesting things, we have both keys behind us here in the exhibit space. One was a practice key that he left here to delude the Confederates thinking that this was the real key. He took the one that operated, the functional key, that's the one he threw up and hid, and he reconnected when he came back in town. They were greatly relieved. A lot of the correspondence, letters, things that, we, that passed down through, unfortunately, oral history, which is not nearly exact as written history, so we have to sort of take some of that oral information with a, with a grain of salt, but if you collect enough of it and it sounds the same, you know, it's pretty well, it did actually happen. <clears throat> yeah, well, with the, the German background going on here, pretzels was a very popular, not so much a snack as we would see it today, but it was actually almost a food because it wasn't the, the, sh the smaller pretzels you would see at a bar, you know, on the counter of a bar. You're, it was the larger dough-like pretzels that, were, that they were making. And um, it, pretzels, uh, for many Germans at that point, was breakfast. So it was kind of interesting. I'm glad the Confederates enjoyed whatever they found here, but most of them tried to pay it with Confederate script, and everybody, and, or they just walked in and said, well, you're now Confederate territory, and these are Yankee property. It is now con under Confederate protection. Is that the phrase? That you, <laughs> I think one yeah. to two letters said, you know, what are you protecting? <laughs> As a, he was still a colonel at that point then, I, he became a brevet brigadier general as a result of his campaign with Gettysburg. It was a remarkable commander. His troops loved him. They, uh, he was kind to their horses. You know, he rested them when they needed to be as opposed to driving them to the, to the became lame. Uh, but uh, this is basically where his name starts to appear and as a frontline soldier, you know, and then of course it transitioned out onto, into Gettysburg. The museum really helped. Everybody locally knew there was a battle here because there's enough markers and tribute material, you know, around uh, either accessing or in, in Hanover. But there was never really a physical, educational, academic presence of it that we tried to, you know, to include here, with, complete with maps and artifacts and relics that, you know, we're, we're looking at here now. So we wanted to make this a more permanent uh, element of the Battle of, of Hanover and the importance it had leading up to the Battle of Gettysburg.